You're listening to the Breast Cancer Stories podcast. Our mission with this podcast is to help you and the people who love you through the shock of diagnosis and treatment. I'm Kristen Wengler, and today, I'll be honest, I'm a little giddy because we have a special guest I've been raving about for the last two years, and I cannot wait for you to meet her. I'm Eva Shea, and my co-host Kristen is such an organized, thoughtful list maker and planner that a few months back, we decided to do a special episode called The Things You Need for Radiation, and I'll put that in the show notes. Today, however, we are doing The Things You Need for Surgery. And our guest for this is an expert in the things you need for surgery. Dana Donafrey is the CEO and founder of Ana Ono. Dana founded Ana Ono out of her own necessity and desire for not only beautiful but comfortable lingerie after her cancer diagnosis in 2010. With a degree in fashion design from Savannah College of Art and Design and a successful industry career, she took her experience and applied it toward launching Ana Ono into myths designed differently. Dana's story has been featured on USA Today, The Today Show, New York Times, and many others. She's been listed as an Inc. 100 female founder, Forbes Next 1000, and Vogue has highlighted Ana Ono as a brand modernizing bras. Even with these accomplishments, she is most proud of making a difference in the lives of people worldwide and is honored to continue to spread her mission of boob inclusive because everyone deserves to feel beautiful, one breast, two breasts, no breasts, or new breasts. Welcome, Dana. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Okay, you got to start with what is boob inclusion? (laughs) So I've I've had Ana Ono for eight and a half years, but I conceptualized it in 2011, a year after my mastectomy and, and reconstruction. And so it's been a long time. I've been trying to change the conversation, pointing out that, you know, we're not just humans walking around, like wanting and desiring two breasts, whether we have them or don't have them, whether we've lost them, whether we decide to remove them. And it just kind of came to this place where we were sitting here and we're like inclusion, diversity and equity. And, you know, all of these conversations are picking up, which they should be, they absolutely should be. But I, I still sit here and I grapple with myself because every bra line known to humans is making bras for people with two breasts. Like even the old school mastectomy bras are are made. So when you amputate your breasts from your body, you replace them with breast forms and you continue to kind of keep living your life as normal, right? But we know for those of us that have been there and done this, like this is not normal. Our lives are not normal. They are very complicated. They are full of trauma. We've been through multiple, multiple surgeries. And I just I wanted to bring attention that there's like millions of us that are living without breasts or living with one breast or living with rebuilt breasts. And like, let's just talk about it. Like, let's just have like the real conversation about it. Let's not pretend that this isn't happening on the side. So boob inclusive was born for us. It really is, you know, two boobs, one boob, no boobs or new boobs. You know, we want everybody to feel just as beautiful and sexy as they were before their cancer diagnosis. And we know that that's not easy, right? That's very, very hard, very complicated, but we want to at least give the pathway to getting there. Is that a sticker that I can get for my sticker collection? Cause it's so funny. Ooh, stickers. I would love that. Yeah, we should, you know, it, you never really know how things start and where it's going to end, but we did have a great time with our boob inclusive bomber, which celebrated our eight years in business. And it was an anniversary month special. Again, it's like, how can you bring awareness with art and conversation? That's really where I dive into is like breast cancer really does touch almost every single one of us in some way, shape or form. So to me, that's like that impact of being able to like educate and inform even in its simplest ways. Yeah. So both of you have had several surgeries. I think for the purpose of what we're talking about today for the shopping list, we're talking about the mastectomy surgery, but I think it's important to kind of give an overview of what you've already been through. So we know where you're coming from with your recommendations. I'll let you go first, Dana. So my first surgery was in 2010. I got diagnosed with breast cancer a day before my 28th birthday and didn't have a huge family history of any sorts of cancer. So it came as a complete shock to myself and my fiance and my family. We were getting planning to get married in 
two months had to cancel and postpone and rearrange our entire lives. And that's what happens when you get cancer. I say all that because in 2010, I mean, we're talking about 12 years ago now, surgery was very, very different a decade ago. And there's been so many improvements and so many impactful, outrageously patient benefiting procedure advancements, which is great. So I won't divulge too much on where I was because I think it's not as relevant as it is today, but I did recently, just in December of last year, undergo a conversion of under the muscle to over the muscle with my breast implants. And that to me has been a completely game-changing, life-changing procedure in so many ways. I mean, I spent like the last 10 years and pretty severe back and shoulder and neck pain. I've been really limited on my physical activity because of the implants being under the muscle. So going over the muscle was, was really impactful. And, but, you know, things are different. What I needed for my mastectomy recovery was very different than what I needed for my revision recovery. There's multiple different phases to the, the cancer post-op schedule. And yeah, I'm excited to sort of share my experience, but take it away, Kristen. Well, those who've been listening for a while pretty much know my story, but I had a, uh, a double mastectomy a year ago last June. And with that, I did reconstruction and I had the expanders, then I did radiation. So that added a whole other situation. And then I had the exchange surgery where they took out the expanders and put in the implants. And I'm about 13 weeks out of having the fat transfer. And so the surgeries are real fresh in my mind. And, and when was your revision? It was pretty recent. Uh, yeah, just about eight months ago. Okay. How are you feeling from that? Do you feel like everything's... I mean, I feel great. I healed very, very quickly. It was not at all from the mastectomy to the expanders to the exchange that was felt a lot more traumatic and a lot more difficult to recover from. This surgery has been more difficult to recover because of different reasons. Going from under to over the muscle was like, I immediately woke up and my doctor, uh, Dr. Israeli at Nybrawl said, how do you feel? And the first words that came out of my mouth were, my back pain is gone. And I was shocked that it was so immediate. I thought it was going to be something I was going to transition out of over time. So when I tell you I was going to physical massage therapy for scar tissue and like chiropractic care for my back every week for the last 10 years of my life every week. And if I missed one or two weeks, I, I paid for it dramatically. And so I was living pretty severe pain and to wake up in an instant and have that pain gone was a shock factor. So I'm just giving my mind and body like time to heal. But I think, you know, it's a really important thing to talk about. Surgeries are very traumatic to like the human body. So you've got to be prepared for that. And I think too, like, this isn't just one surgery, right? You've been through multiple surgeries. I've been through multiple surgeries. So it's just, you've got to be mindful of that too. Like how much can you endure and what can your body really handle? And, and what does that look like for each individual person? But that's been sort of my experience with this most recent one. You want to ever explain maybe why having implants under the muscle would have caused you that much trouble? Your implants go under the muscle, which was pretty much the only way it was done when I was had surgery, you had two options really for implant surgery when I was operated on. One was called a lat flap, L-A-T. The lat flap takes a part of your latissimus dorsi muscle, carves it out, flips it around to the front, gives a support system to the implants. That was not often done where I was living at the time, Colorado, because most of the women that were getting the operations were very active athletes and rock climbers and things like that. So sort of dissecting that back muscle became not in practice because people couldn't function. So instead they, I sort of say filet, but you know, if you butterfly a steak before or, or a piece of chicken, you know, you cut it in half and then you, you open it up. Well, that's what they do to your chest wall muscle. If they don't do the lat flap, they, it was in practice to filet your chest wall muscle and insert the implant in between your chest wall. So your chest muscle loses 50% of its functionality. You can't do push-ups, you can't do pull-ups. I mean, exercise becomes very difficult because you're only using half of your chest wall. Well, of course, you cut into any major muscle, you're going to probably likely have other issues. I already had a messed up back because I was a dancer my whole life. So I think it just exacerbated like a lot of like already early injuries in my, in my body. But now that my chest muscle has been put back together, I can tell you like 
I'm standing taller. My shoulders sit back better, which is like released all of my neck pain. Cause like my muscles were like in a constant state of stress. Yeah. So now what's happened is they've really started to perfect the procedure of keeping the chest muscle intact and being able to put the implants on top of it. Nothing's perfect in reconstructive surgery. Like you will never have what you lost. This is just a replacement item. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, those expectations, although plastic surgeons strive so much to give you the best, most optimal results humanly possible, they still will never replace your breast. Yeah. Let's get to the fun part. Let's talk about shopping. (laughs) (laughs) okay let's take it from in timeline order from let's start with what you need on the way in and while you're at the hospital you know i mean i'll go first because i I think this exact conversation is like 110 percent the reason why i made ana ono like everything that we're about to talk about is like i just could not believe how unprepared I was when I like rolled into my mastectomy surgery. First of all, I I was 27 years old. So let's account for that. I never had had a major operation except for my wisdom teeth being pulled out and my tonsils. (laughs) And I never had to stay overnight in a hospital. I understood to a certain extent what I was about to enter into, but not really because this is 2010. Like we did not have the internet like it is today. We were barely on Instagram. Facebook was legitimately your friends. And I didn't meet another young person with breast cancer. Like I didn't meet barely anybody with breast cancer. So I had nobody to talk to, to get ideas of like, how am I even supposed to embark on this? I love this conversation. And the reason why I want to start off, because I went to the hospital like you would in a pair of sweatpants and a t-shirt, because what else do you go to the hospital with? So when they said, you're not going to be able to remove your arms after your mastectomy surgery, that didn't compute to like, oh, I can't put on a shirt. Right. So I literally had to send friends out of my neighbor friends to Costco to get me a zipper hoodie so I could leave the hospital in one piece Mm -hmm. and not in a surgical bra and like the freezing temperatures of Colorado. (laughs) Yeah. Because I went to the hospital with a hoodie, a t-shirt and sweatpants. That seems like the quintessential hospital outfit. No, it's not. It's not. Not when you have a mastectomy surgery. Mm -mm. You must have something that closes and opens in the front. So I go into the zipper hoodie. I have my drain tubes that are the tubes that extract like the extra fluid so you can heal faster from the mastectomy. Safety pin to the straps of my surgery bra that I'm already calling the Iron Maiden because it's like up to my <laughs> collarbone. It's like, it's like squeezing my rib cage in places. Like I feel like there's an elephant sitting on my chest. I have these blood bulbous things, safety pinned to my face practically. And then a hoodie <laughs> sweatshirt. And I was like, this is horrible. This is so disturbing that this is how I'm expected to walk out of this place. Like a dissected human. It's really what it felt like. Yeah. I mean, if, I can't imagine those drains. They're like goiters on your neck almost because they're so mm-hmm. high and they're, they're <laughs> well, and Eva and I were having the conversation about how people are like, oh, just safety pin it to the bottom of your bra. I'm like, really? Because you just had surgery and you want something else pulling mm-hmm. down. You can't even move. Any movement hurts. All of that movement hurts. And like, even still, so then I get, I have this one zipper hoodie. And then I'm like, okay, well now what do I wear? So my mom ran out to Marshall's because I had nothing. When I'm saying there was zero prep, there was zero prep. I did not realize it was this complicated. So she runs out to Marshall's. The only robe that they had in my size was like this. I actually still have it in my sample room. I should like frame it one day. It was like this teal turquoise carry robe with like ruffles around the neck, ruffles around the arm. And I looked at my mom, I was like, this was all that was there. Like I'm a New York fashion designer at this point in time in my life. I'm like chic and I'm sophisticated and I'm sexy and all of these things. I'm like, mom, really? She's like, this is the only thing that they had. And what did I do? I lived in that gross, disgusting Terry robe for weeks on end, 
neighbors were coming by, friends were coming by, people was bringing me food, hot mess express on my end. And then that is so much why like I designed all the solutions I designed with Ana Ono because I was like, okay, so I needed a robe. I needed something to hold the drains. How do I get all of these things into one garment, one piece? And it was like, and then the Miana robe was born and the Abbey lounge pant with the hidden pockets. And I'm just like, I want to feel good. Like, I still want to feel like myself, even though I'm like this dissected human. I just want to feel beautiful. Like, why can't I have that one simple thing? And anyway, so now I went to my surgery and the Miana robe and the Abbey pants. I actually got to use all my products for the first time in December. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> in real time. So it was kind of full circle, right? I mean, I, I invented and created because of solving my own problems, but I never actually had everything in use. And now I was like, oh yeah, this is great. Oh man, I wish I had had this 10 years ago. <laughs> well, you know, I didn't realize that the Abbey pants have places for the drains until yeah. my second surgery. I wore them. I wore them for like, I don't know, six months, eight months before that. And then I was like, it's like a little thing for my key. And I'm like, no, there's two. It's for the drains. So that was ingenious. I don't know if it was like this for you, but when I got diagnosed, especially back then, it was like, everybody was just like sending me all of this. I'm going to say crap because it was really crap that just had like pink ribbons on it. And like, you know, there was like surgical tops, but like, oh my God, do they look like a surgical top? Like, I'm like, ugh, yeah. like not wearing it, <laughs> yeah. not. I'm just like, I will find another solution for myself. So, and I, and I'm just like, I'm not wasteful. So like, even like we have this beautiful robe, it's got a detachable drain belt, but that's so you can throw the drain belt in the trash when yep. you don't need it anymore. And yep. you can burn it. You can do whatever you want to do with it. But like, you're not throwing away a really beautiful piece of apparel because like it's made out of this like buttery model material. It's soft. It's cozy. Like I don't want to have to buy something just because I need it for a moment in time. Like. Absolutely. Well, and making it something that's useful afterward is so huge because I do, I, I have a whole plastic bin that is things for surgery. Mm-hmm. Because I, I mean, I need, I need to pass it on now, but it's because I, because of, I knew I was going to have more surgeries and though I'm not using any of those things anymore, right. except for the clothing that I got mm-hmm. from Ana Ono. And the thing I'll say is I can count on one hand, how many times in the past year and a half since I started chemo that I actually felt halfway attractive oh. between losing your hair between gaining weight, between all of the the swelling, I still am working on edema in my legs Mm -hmm. and all of that, like you just don't feel like yourself. And then you try to put pants on that maybe have a waistband and you're like, okay. And so having something that moves with your body is essential. Okay. So I'm going to like fangirl a little bit. Everybody who's been listening to this knows that I cry easily. But really, Dana, one of the reasons that I started following you and I started and I really wanted you on the show and connected with you, people are going to be like, oh, Kristen, really? She's sitting right there. How much are you going to kiss up? But truly, like Ana Ono's clothing and bras, lingerie, loungewear changed how I feel every day. And I can put things on that I know are going to be quick and easy and comfortable. And you really did change my life at a time in my life when I didn't know if I was going to live or not. And it's the biggest gift, truly. And so I just want to really, really, from the bottom of my heart, say thank you for going before me. I'm sorry that you went before me in this way, but for making something beautiful out of something that was so hard. And you've changed so many lives. So I just want to say thank you. And I really appreciate you saying that because, you know, this is, this is hard, right? Like running this business and building a business is like one of the hardest things I've done in my entire life. I love it, but it's hard. And for me, it's, you know, making clothes, it's the easy part because I've done it my entire life. But I just like, I say over and over that Ana Ono is more than a bra. And the reason why I say that is because it's that to me personally, it was like, 
just how distraught and disturbed I was like looking at my body in the mirror and like feeling like I wasn't attractive anymore, that my fiance, my soon to be husband was like, not going to find me sexy because my nipples were gone. So much of it was for me, not for you. Right. But it was like, it was my body. It was my mind. It was my heart that was broke. And I was just trying to put my pieces back together. And I, I knew why I was so broken. And I just I had the tools in my own toolbox to fix my life. I never expected or intended for that to affect other people's lives. But I'm so honored that it is and it does. Because for me, it was like I cried over and over again in these dressing rooms. I cried every time I went clothes shopping. I cried every time I looked in the mirror. And I'm not a crier. Like for me, like my life, you know, I was raised by a dad, like tough girls don't cry, you know? And I was, I'm a tough girl. Like I just was built that way. I've got really thick skin. I've been in the industry for way too damn long. It's like all of those things. And I just, it's like to hear that is like, that's like the encouragement and the energy and the power that like I need to absorb to keep going. And like my ultimate goal is like that people newly diagnosed don't have to cry in those dressing rooms. They don't have to feel that way. Right. Like if we can get there and we can help keep the pieces together on the very, very bottom, bottom level, then maybe there's hope that you can like recover better because you feel better. And I just was like, I hit all that rock bottom so many times. And I was just like, I don't want somebody else to have to go through this. So thank you for sharing that little piece of your life with me, because like that is, it, it's true. It's like, I, I tell people all the time, like this can be life-changing. It is. And I'm not saying that because I'm taking it to some level that it doesn't need to be. It's because of the stories that people share with me that I know it's like, sometimes the simplest things in your life are the most impactful. Absolutely. Well, and I found it because my cousin sent me this rope and we got so off and we talked about our Mianna rope so much. There's so many good stories behind that row, but it's only one thing you need. So next you need front closure bras, which you're, you're wearing uh, one of my favorites for my exchange surgery today, the Bianca, but there's, uh, there, we have two different front closure bras and there's, you know, there's a lot of front closure bras out there. So just, you know, that's, that's what you need. That's what you get. I, I want to remind everybody that if you are undergoing a mastectomy surgery, preventative or due to a diagnosis, you have full access your health insurance benefits should recover anywhere from about four to six bras a year as a part of your treatment and therapy. So feel free to reach out to us at onono.com. We can get you reimbursable receipts. We can direct you to a store in your area, but we have two versions. One, very, very soft for sort of the early part of your process. The initial mastectomy surgery, Definitely, if you're in expanders, because a uh, compression is not often a requirement at that phase, unless your doctor tells you otherwise. Flap surgeries that are a little bit more in intensive surgeries. So the Aurora is like really, really soft. It's made out of that buttery model. There's no seams that are going to hurt you or poke you in places. And then the one that you're wearing, the Bianca, has a little bit more compression. So like I lived in the Bianca after my exchange surgery because I needed a little bit more structure. I needed a little bit more pressure around my chest when I went over the muscle. But that's sort of the two ideas behind the two different front closure bras, but both for post-operative care. Yes, absolutely. And the other bra that I, I wore constantly was the Leslie. And it's, mm -hmm. I didn't put it over my head. I pulled it up <laughs> over so, my hips and up. <laughs> yeah, designed to step into. Seriously, yeah. yeah. I have four of them. I use them for radiation too. Well, that's great for the expanders because you should talk a little bit about the expanders since it's so fresh. Like how oh, was sure. that for you? Like, was your skin tight? Like I just, I was so uncomfortable during the expansion process. It was horrible. It was horrible. So the expanders for anybody who, who doesn't know, and maybe you're a caregiver or, you know, you're, you're about to have surgery. The expanders are necessary because it's like a placeholder for where your implants are going to go. So it's really only in reconstructive surgery that you're going to have those. And so it's basically flat on the bottom. And then there's a pocket that holds saline. There's like a little port in it. And so your expanders are filled with, with saline to get to whatever size is right for your body or whatever you've talked with your plastic surgeon about. And they're rigid on the bottom and they're not comfortable. It does feel like a basketball. 
you know, the flat basketball on your chest and your skin is just it literally expanding. And so having something that's soft, like I had the Aurora and the Leslie for after my mastectomy and the Bianca was better for the last two surgeries. You really do want something that's soft. So then with the expanders, with radiation, that one side gets much tighter. And so even I laughed a lot because <laughs> she called them my Franken boobs. <laughs> I called them my SpongeBob square tits. <laughs> Seriously. Totally. Yeah. The yeah. badly wrapped package. It yeah. uh, yes. My Lego locks, anything square. Because my expanders back then were square. They were oh, literally wow. building blocks. There was one square on the back and then there was another square on the front. And as they got filled up, the second depository would expand. And I literally had squares on my chest. So before I started on oh no, I understood how I couldn't fit a square boob into a round bra. It made a lot of sense to me. That's why there was the problem. I had no concept. <laughs> yeah. So now the expanders are actually kind of round, kind of. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so we had we had square expanders back then. My SpongeBob square tits. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's important that that part of that rigidness during the expansion process is an important thing to talk about because that is why you have to look for like soft structured bras, tank tops, camisoles, things like that, because those rigid objects inside your body are not squishing and moving and moving around into like a regular cup of a bra. Like they're not where they land on your chest and where they are getting expanded is exactly where they will stay. Right. You do not move these things around. You not lift them into a push-up bra. We don't squish them together with a sports bra where they are. They are. And that is it. Exactly. They do not move. But with the bras, I think I probably had it was like probably three weeks before I could actually wear one Mm -hmm. after the Mm -hmm. mastectomy. And so you don't mess around with that. You know, you do what they tell you to do, but those saved me. So we're talking a lot about clothing because we have the expert here. Something that's fun to talk about with your bras is they're named after people. They are. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, I love this part of Ana Ono because something that was very new When we first launched, it was all about the people that we served. And I just thought it was really, really bizarre that when I was expected to buy a mastectomy bra, I was shopping for these bras on healthy, beautiful, gorgeous, breasted women. I felt like it was a huge slap in my face. I'm not saying that we're not gorgeous, but it was just like, I can see her healthy boobs. I can see her healthy cleavage. And you want me to think that that fits me when I know my boobs don't act like that anymore. And so what was really ingrained in us from the beginning, well, and not to mention, I was just having to ask a lot of my beautiful friends to take off their clothes in front of cameras. Like that was completely normal. (laughs) And that's who was supporting me when I first started. So it happened so organically. And I was like trying to think of like names for bras and like all of my friends, all these beautiful people I was meeting. I was like, these are the names of why I'm here and what we're doing. And so, yeah, every bra or design has a a namesake. It can come from who's modeled it. It can come from a situation or circumstance or somebody who's really inspired me. But, you know, I I love that part. And it's always kind of bizarre how it happens. It just sort of embarks and embeds inside the story. And and like the Mienna robe, for instance, I mean, I could go on and on and on about Mienna herself, but very quickly, I think what's really empowering and impactful is that she was a Pakistani woman And she was living with stage four metastatic breast cancer, which is the only breast cancer that kills. And she knew she didn't have long and she wanted to bring awareness to the disease. And culturally speaking, this photo shoot was very inappropriate for her and her family. And and she had a lot of issues with her family and, and what she was allowed to do and not allowed to do. And I was very open with her. I said, you know, we don't have to put you in a bra, but I don't really have any camisoles. We can do a robe. Well, she eventually said, you know what? I I said, there's not going to be an opportunity I'm going to turn down because I don't have much more time to live. And I, I want to do this no matter what it means, because I think it's important that women from my culture understand what we're going through. And I said, I will support you in any which way possible. And we brought her to the shoot and she, we had such a blast. Oh my God, did we have 
so much fun. Her smile, her energy, everything. And I, I named the robe Miana. And I asked her if I could name the robe after her because she had really, really impacted me in my life um, in that moment. And had just a few weeks later, she passed away. Mm. And I reached out to her son and I told her son, I said, I know what your mother was struggling with. I know what she was going through. We had a lot of really amazing talks, but I want to let you know, I have incredible, beautiful images of your mother where she is glowing and she is happy. And I said, but I understand your circumstances. And I just want you to know if you ever want these images, I have them. And they, they are yours. And he, he did write me back and he took the images where most of her clothes were on, which was completely <laughs> fine and appropriate. But I just, you know, I just thought it was really special because it was such a moment for her. And, you know, this is one of our longest items in our collection ever. I mean, this robe has been in our line for seven and a half years, you know? So it's, it's just really beautiful to me that I get to say her name every mm-hmm. day. I know that that energy is walking its way into the hospital room or into the bedroom of every single amazing patient that gets it as a gift or, or buys it for themselves or whatever. Like that energy goes with that product. And I love that. Oh, wow. And I just got chills. So I, I, know. Know she's, <laughs> I know she's with me. Yeah. I know she's tapping on my shoulder. I'm going to be thinking about that all the time now with my robe every mm-hmm. time. Yeah. What we're going to do too, is we're going to have a full list in the show notes of, of suggestions, because we're not going to get to all of those things today. But when you're going to the hospital, a couple things that you really need are uh, a pillow, obviously to sleep on comfortably, but also to put between your seatbelt and your chest when you're coming home. They have all kinds of mastectomy pillows and with pockets and like different pink ribbons and all of that. But if you just get a small pillow that's comfortable and soft, that's essential. And a buddy who drives well and doesn't hit the bumps Yes. He has a sofa on wheels. Like, yeah, comfortable car, seat belt, pillow for sure. There's a park puff out there designed by a, another survivor herself, Rachel. She's really, it's really so comfortable. I was like, everywhere I drove, I held the seat belt away from my body with my two hands. I actually had a stuffed animal dog because they didn't make boob pillows when <laughs> I was in surgery. I put my stuffed pillow dog because my, my husband brought it to me to the hospital. But yeah, those bumps, man, on your ride home, just, yeah. If you've got somebody that's got a van or a Subaru, something you can get Crown Victoria, you know, Rolls Royce, whatever you do you, <laughs> but you know, it's like, it, it, you're right. <laughs> One of my favorites. And Dana, if you haven't discovered these, you need to, if you've ever heard of Kite Baby, K-Y-T-E, huh? uh Eva turned me on to these and they make a lot of like baby wear and baby sacks and all of that. I have the best sleep sacks, actually. Their sleep sacks are bamboo and they make them in three different weights. Mm. They were all the rage when I had my second daughter and that was how I got into them. They're so soft that I was like, Mm -hmm. must make adult pajamas in this fabric. And so... I sent, they did, and I sent some to Kristen just to see if she would even wear them. Mm -hmm. Well, and you sent them to me during chemo. I was waking up three times a night sweating, eating popsicles, all of that. And so the ones that Eva sent me are kind of like joggers. It was a a pullover, long sleeve. And oh my gosh, I quit sweating and I became addicted to them. They also make some that open in the front. And they make them in shorts and they make them in long pants and long sleeves. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would literally (laughs) wear the shorts to that under my Miena robe. And also the wrap dress that y'all have. I lived in that afterward because I actually felt cute in it. You know, and I think we have a giveaway also. We do. If you sign up for our newsletter, which is the link is in the show notes. After this episode airs, we will give away a free pair of Kite Baby pajamas. And then Dana has a surprise for us at the end too, I think. So far, we've talked about having a comfortable robe. A Miena robe, I have to say it's essential. I wore mine home with my pajama bottoms and a comfortable pillow. So we're talking about basically what you're going to take to the hospital with you, right? When you get out of surgery, you have to wear their bras. So you don't need Mm -hmm. to either 
when you go to surgery, they put you in it, don't they? Oh yeah. They put you mm-hmm. in it during surgery and you, you don't take it off until they tell you to take it off. So when you pack your bag, you're going to want to have, of course, your phone charger, pajamas, robe, your lounge pants. Also something that I got was my simple modern. You want something with a straw mm-hmm. because you're not going to be lifting your hand like this, <laughs> you know, up to drink. I had two friends that got me those and I had no idea that I would need something really with a straw. And then when you get home is like a pill sorter so that you can put your, all your meds Mm -hmm. that you've already picked up beforehand. You can have them ready and have a surgery buddy help you with that. A wedge pillow, because you're basically creating a recliner in your bed because you can't, you're sleeping on your back. Eva and I shared a hotel room at a podcast convention about yeah. six months ago, and she got to see my <laughs> your pillow structure. I, I called it my pillow throne. Yeah, because I had a pillow under each arm. Also, just that's a hint, yes. y'all. You need you don't even think about it, but if you have a pillow to support your arms, it's going to help from pulling down on you know where incisions are and and all of that. And they're going to have you get some Hibiclens, which is antibiotic special wash. And then something I didn't think of, but a friend told me and brought me some were like body wash wipes. And I'm not talking about like baby wipes. I'm talking about they're thick. They're like almost like a washcloth that is disposable because I think it was two weeks before I could take a full shower. And so everybody wins if you use those. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, like how do you take care of yourself afterwards? I think we have to also remember that not everybody has a caregiver at home, you know? So, so much of what you've already said, Kristen is so important, but like that early prep before you go to the hospital too, take any cups or plates or things you're going to want to like make for food, like put them on your counter because you won't be able to reach into your cupboard making sure that like on your refrigerator, you know, if your freezer is on the top that, you know, you've got things in your refrigerator that you can grab because you, you can't even reach into your freezer. Just making sure that things around you are very accessible, like those small things that you don't think about, but you know, just like keep your bag light, right? Because you, you can't carry more than just holding more than one or two pounds. No. So making sure that you keep it, you know, don't overpack for the hospital. No, don't. You really don't need to. So I think we've hit. Is there anything else that you're thinking of that we probably need for surgery? No, I think that that's all great feedback for surgery. And it's sort of like my top items. I mean, just to recap, you need comfortable, easy to put on clothing, especially pants. And like, you're not going to be like yanking up your, your yoga leggings and things like that because they just take too much effort. I love the slip on shoes, huge, huge game changer. Yeah. I love the pillows, body pillows, chest pillows, seatbelt pillows, pillow, pillow, pillows. Absolutely. I want to ask you, Dana, Mm -hmm. one thing that we've been sort of quietly discussing is where do we put our other resources, our support, our time, and eventually maybe dollars? toward larger causes within breast cancer space because a lot of what we've seen, and I was already aware that the whole October, Pinktober thing, like I really thought when they put the pink on KFC chicken buckets that we'd probably gone too far. (laughs) That was like 10 years ago when I found that. That was a lot. You've been in the space for a minute now, and I wonder if you have any thoughts you can share on fundraising within the breast cancer space and where you think we should approach directing our resources as people who want to do more? I love this question. And thank you for asking that because it is really important. And something we sort of did touch on earlier was when I said I got a bunch of pink ribbon crap. I say this for the patients, for the caregivers, for the people that love those that have been affected and are lost to the disease. Nine times out of 10, buying that pink ribbon tchotchke off of the shelf in the month of October in a major massive retailer is likely not doing anything for the cause. That is when people profit from pink, right? It's October is not a holiday and breast cancer is not a celebration. It is very, very serious. And, you know, we, we shouldn't have pink ribbons right next to Halloween decorations. Like, it's been commercialized for the wrong reasons. It's not to say that 
you know, there's a lot of companies, there's a lot of people that have shop to support programs during the month of October, which are really impactful. I mean, some of these programs fund entire resources and nonprofits and organizations because of the shop to support. So if you're going to buy that pink ribbon merchandise because you want it or because somebody else you care for likes it, then just make sure you read the fine print. Is it going somewhere and to where? If it says 5% of net proceeds fund breast cancer awareness, you know that money is going nowhere because they haven't identified a nonprofit. They haven't told you where it's going and there is no dollar figure attached to it. But you know there are incredible programs, Breast Cancer Research Fund. They have a huge October shopping campaign because of all of the high fashion brands that they work with. And that makes up like a huge portion of their budget. And they are actually researching the issues, causes, prevention, disease progression, research dollars matter for our disease. It absolutely 100% does. If you have the means to give, give to an organization like metaviver.org. They take 100% of your donation. And I'm going to say this again, 100% of your donated dollars will fund a scientist that is trying to help stage four metastatic breast cancer. We all win in that. Their administration fees, the ways that they run their organization is funded by other resources. So that means if you give them $100, that's $100 a scientist is going to receive for a grant to end stage four breast cancer and its its terminal effects, right? We want all cancer to be treated as a long-term chronic illness. If we can get there, we really all win. So I just urge you that If it's $10 for a pink ribbon cup or it's a $10 donation to Metaviver, give the $10 to Metaviver. It gives you the the pathway to what it is that we need as a community. And it's so, so very important. I mean, there's other organizations that help support the patients themselves. Living Beyond Breast Cancer is an incredible organization that gives trusted information, a community of support. The Breasties is a beautiful organization for young women affected by gynecological and breast cancer. And there's a lot of local nonprofits. You know, almost every single city or state will have a local grassroots organization that's there to impact the lives of those that are diagnosed in your area, from trips to the doctor to help with medical bills. So if that organization affects the patient directly, all thumbs up, like give, 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 support, volunteer, and get engaged however you can do it. If an organization says that they fund breast cancer awareness, that time has passed. We're pretty aware. We're pretty aware that breast cancer is a problem. Yeah. We know about it. Yeah. I live in Austin and my team here, our podcast team is going to, it's going to sound a little funny, but there's an event called Scare for the Cure. And the whole thing is to fund all the Austin area breast cancer organizations. And so we're helping build the haunted house. And the guy who put that on is like a Hollywood special effects guy. And he he builds the whole thing and the all of the money, every single dollar goes to the local organizations. Amazing, amazing. Thank you for everything today. It was really a treat to, to have you on and hear all of the great things that you're working on and where you've come from. And we agree, it is hard to run. It's hard to run your own stuff, especially when you're dealing with chronic illness. Kristen and Dana's amazing list of what you need we'll put into a very nice PDF. You can download it from the show notes, print it out, and go shopping. We'll make sure all those links are available. Of course, you can find all of the Ana Ono products at AnaOno.com, but we are partners with Ana Ono as an affiliate. So if you shop through us, we do get a little bit of support back for the show. So we appreciate it if you could use those links. And thank you to Dana our listeners also get an extra 15% off with the promo code STORIES15. So you have to use our links and the promo code at the same time to get the 15% off and help us. So make sure you use the links in our show notes for that. If you're listening today, we want to ask you for a special favor. If you love the podcast and have learned something from it, if it has helped you in any way, follow us on Apple Podcasts, tell your friends, And write a review if you have a minute on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening. If you would like to support our show with a one-time or recurring donation, go to breastcancerstoriespodcast.com slash donate and look for the donate link. 
You can now support Breast Cancer Stories by becoming a premium subscriber on Apple Podcasts. You will get early access to special episodes and support our efforts to continue helping women through the shock of breast cancer diagnosis and treatment. And of course, to get special updates and be notified by email when a new episode is available, click the link in the show notes to sign up for our newsletter. And if you sign up for the newsletter one week from today, we will draw a winner from that list for the free Kite Baby pajamas in whatever size you want. So uh, you going to love them. They're amazing. <laughs> or if you have a baby or know someone with a baby, you can also buy them something. Follow us on Instagram at Breast Cancer Stories. Thanks for listening to Breast Cancer Stories. If you're facing a breast cancer diagnosis and you want to tell your story on the podcast, send an email to hello at theaxis.io. I'm Eva Shea, your host and executive producer. Production support for the show comes from Mary Ellen Clarkson, and our engineer is Daniel Cruiser. Breast Cancer Stories is a production of The Axis, T-H-E-A-X-I-S dot I-O.